Hi, my name is Soila Kenya and I make book content on this channel. If that sounds interesting to you, you can subscribe and like the video and follow me on social media. All of these is where I am and they'll be linked in the description as well. Also, in this video, you can use the timestamps in the description to like jump around, but like you should just like watch the whole thing, you know, you know, you know. And stick to the end for a readathon announcement that I'm holding with Lexa Reads. Just in case you hear any background sounds, that's my roommate and her friend. So, you know, just like bear with me. I just had to film this video. I've been gone for like <laughs> two months, I think. Yeah. So it was time to come back. You know, school happened. That's all I'm going to say about that. Let's get into the video, okay? So as you can see from the title, I read and watched Coraline, which is a book by Neil Gaiman. He published it in 2002, and then a movie was made, and like several other things, I think like comic books and video games. But basically the story of Coraline follows a girl called Coraline, who's 11 years old and she lives in England, where Neil Gaiman is from. Um, so it's just her and her parents and they move to this new house, which is like a house, but it's been turned into flats. So it has like some weird architecture going on. And her parents basically just are very dismissive of her. They're always working and they kind of like treat her like she's a bother. And she's a restless kid. She's a curious kid. So she's always going up to them like, for things and they're just like mm, not now like stop bothering me I'm walking and in one of the times when she's like told told to go off to do her own thing uh, she stumbles across this door in the house that just has a brick wall when you open it so like there's no pathway or a room it leads to it's just a brick wall and of course this is extremely strange but as I said the architecture of the place is weird because it's a house that's been turned into flats. And so, of course, Coraline is an extremely curious child. She's like, like what's going on here? And basically, through a, a series of events, one of her neighbors, which, by the way, like all their neighbors are really creepy, like the people who live in the other flats, there's Mr. Bobo, who like no one knows about. He's just a creepy old man. And then there's Miss Pink and Miss Forcible. And they are like former uh, theater actresses. And they're like always reminiscing about their like the days in the prime, I guess. And it's, I mean, they're all just very funny but strange people. But anyway, so Mr. Bobo warns Coraline not to go through the door. Now remember, this door is just a brick wall as far as we know up to this point. But like, as you might have guessed, that's not all there is to it. So either the second or third time she opens the door, I can't remember, but either the second or third time she opens the door, it's not just a brick wall anymore, but there's like a pathway, which is a, like a portal to another world. And of course, as I said, she's very curious. So she goes in and on the other side, there's she finds her other mother and other father. It's like a parallel universe. And despite the fact that they have buttons for eyes, which is extremely creepy, um, they are very like nice to her as compared to her actual parents. Like they pay attention to her, they cook for her, they like do all these things. But as she soon realizes that other world is messed up, and as much as there's this facade of just like nice things and shiny things and just like a like good environment for her, like a better one, like no, it's just like a painting. But like if you scratch under, it's like extremely messed up. The main conflict of this story is that in her journeys to and from these you know, to and from the real world and that other world, her real parents are captured, which she realizes at some point. And so the main conflict is she has to save her real parents from the other mother. The other mo mother is like the main, protag I mean, the main antagonist, the like villain of the story. And yeah, she's extremely creepy. She eats beetles and like, yeah, it's just disturbing. She also has to save some 
ghosts of dead children <laughs> that she finds on the other side. There's like three kids who the other mother captured long ago and they died while with her there in the other world. And she also discovers that and is also trying to bring them their ghosts or their souls back to this side. This book is a like a modern classic, a modern horror classic. As I said, it's by Neil Gaiman. He's extremely famous, you know, for things like American Gods, Sandman, Stardust. If you remember the movie Stardust, he's the one who wrote the book that was that the movie was based on. This book is described as a dark fantasy, a fairy tale, a horror book. But its target audience is for children. So like all these themes are never like associated with children's books. And I guess that is also like what made it such um, an intriguing piece of literature. It's a novella. It's about 186 pages. It's won the Hugo Award, the Nebula Award, the Bram Stoker Award. Those are very huge awards, like the golden shoe, I think, of awards in the fantasy genre. So that's how good it is. I describe this book as a mixture of Chronicles of Narnia, Alice in Wonderland, and The Adams Family. Maybe that's, I don't know, if you've, if you've read or watched this, what would you describe it as like i feel like those three like cover all the elements that are in this book but let me know what you think which other books or movies you think fit to describe this book yeah so basically it's just a very spoopy book um weird vibes weird creatures monsters like talking cats like the whole like nine yards of spooky i mean i think neil gaiman said he he wanted the book to creep up on you um like that's the effect he wanted to have with the book and yeah i think he achieved that like you could say also the book contains some um, pineapple on pizza slander so for those of you who are like me and actually love pineapple on pizza you have been warned some fun facts about the book about the story Coraline was a typo it was meant to be caroline and then you'll like neil like wrote Coraline by mistake and then it stuck he liked it it stuck and you know that's how that name came about also the book was written over a period of over 10 years because neil started writing it for his first daughter holly when she was five years old but then he just wrote it very slowly because he was just taking his time and by the time he was finishing it his second daughter maddie was six and so he said he started it for his first daughter and finished it for his second and it's just like the sweetest thing like so who wants to read me a book like for me please uh, i'm taking applications just like let me know through the comments also the book was written by hand he wrote it in a notebook that weird house that's like was turned into flats that whole thing was based on neil gaiman's own childhood home the story was meant to be about five to ten pages long when he initially thought it up and he also considered considers it his best work. Okay, so the book. The book is extremely short, which, yeah, it's for kids, so that's a good move. But then also, this book can be read by anyone of any age and that's why it really reminds me of The Chronicles of Narnia and Alice in Wonderland. It treats the audience even though he knows the audience are going to be mostly kids, but he treats them just like thinking, conscious beings who can, who can figure things out. And I mean, I love such literature and I, I love such kids lit that's able to do that. Almost everything about this book was done right. And the more than 10 years that Neil Gaiman took to write it were worth it. So the first thing is that like Coraline's character is extremely likable. And I think when readers say they want strong female characters this book should be given as an example of what a strong female character is because what usually happens is that they give us women who can fight with swords and like punch men in the face which is fine like yeah that's yeah because there are women who are bodybuilders or who are like physically strong and that's yeah that can happen but more so what we mean is we just want women who have agency and who can just do things and go places and just you know explore the world and be independent of th like these ideals 
in society where there has to be a male companion somewhere and Coraline it really represents that to me like a hundred percent she's extremely curious she's what you would call a precocious child she's just all over the place and does not cannot be told no like she wants to go on adventures so for example like there are several characters in the book mostly the neighbors mr bobo and miss fink and miss forcible who get her name wrong they keep calling her caroline and each time that happens almost each time she corrects them she's like no it's it's Coraline, not Caroline, over and over, just to get it across to them. And remember, she's a kid, and these are like old people. But she's like, call me my name, okay? Um, another example is just the whole throughout the plot of the story. I mean, she's dealing with like this witch because the other mother is more or less a witch, or like just an ancient being who has lots of power and is evil. And she stands up to her, like she plays her games in order to get her parents back. Because at some point, basically, she strikes a deal with the other mother. Like, if I'm able to find my parents within this other world of yours, because they are there, but they're just hidden. So she's like, if I'm able to find them, then I can take them back and like go away with them. Um, as well as the souls of the three children. If I don't find them, then you can keep me and I'll be here forever. That's extremely brave for anyone to say, let alone an 11-year-old. It's another world. It's like magic. It's spooky things. Also, she meets, like when she meets the ghosts of these three children, she's just very calm. And where she meets them is like a closet where it's dark. She can't see anything. And then she just starts hearing voices like in her ear. Like that's, a, that's like a jump scare. But she just very calmly just starts having a conversation and I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> Her character is just the best thing about this book and it comes out immediately. Like it does immediately, that's the first thing you get about the book and about her. Also, a friend shared with me that there was this thing going around on how how to know which house you are in Harry Potter and it was something about if you were to meet a locked door, what would you do? Like, would you like knock? Would you find the key? Would you break the door down? And apparently Ravenclaws would find the key. And that's exactly what Coraline does in one scene when it comes to this brick wall. And I'm like, so I guess Coraline is a Ravenclaw in case anyone is wondering. Random uh, information the second thing is that the imagery in the book is really damn good like the people making the movie had no problem because like everything is just very nicely explained the language is simple but the there's some mastery of it you can tell because despite the words being simple this, they are just weaved in a way that is extremely appealing and draws em emotions, they, they adequate emotions throughout. So if he wants you to be scared, if he wants you to be sad, if he wants you to laugh, there's also quite a bit of humor in the book. You will have all those emotions. And it's just 186 pages, which I still can't believe he's able to achieve all that. One thing that might put people off from this, and maybe this was just my experience, but it wasn't very like, oh, I want to find out what happens next. I didn't experience that, but that just might have been the mindset I was in when I was reading the book. But if that's a thing for you, like if you really like fiction, that's like you want to turn the pages and like you can't fall asleep. Like this is not that. This is extremely calm despite the content. Like there's no points where it's like heart pounding well maybe heart pounding because of the creepy stuff but none of that like i want to find out what happens next and that was fine for me but like if that's the type of thing that you want this book doesn't really have that so the movie what did it do right and what did it do wrong i think okay well first of all the movie was made in 2009 it was directed by henry selick who also directed the, a nightmare the, a Nightmare Before Christmas, The Nightmare Before Christmas, which is another very famous movie. As you might know, if you know these two movies, is that there's the use of stop motion. And that is the best selling point of this movie. It's absolutely beautiful to watch, even though the content is creepy. 
but it's just a masterpiece visually speaking all the colors all the creatures that are created because the book has like lots of monsters and like creepy things it's just all very beautiful the cast is also quite star-studded like for example Coraline is voiced by Dakota Fanning and then the other mother is voiced by Terry Hatcher I think what Terry Hatcher did uh how, what is this housewives desperate housewives <laughs> she was in desperate housewives wow in terms of movie making it's really well done I just want to mention the talking cat because that's like just a plus on either side of the book or the movie. The cat in the real world can't speak, but on the other world, it's like it's like her animal companion. And it basically says that names are useless. And so we don't know its name because it's like super wise. It's like the mentor figure in this story. Henry Selick, the director, looks like the animation. I don't know how to explain, but yeah he does right now the movie just like pissed me off because it made Coraline extremely unlikable okay not extremely unlikable but it made her quite unlikable as compared to how she's portrayed in the book I know what they were trying to do they were trying to bring out this this strongness that I'm talking about that Coraline has the bravery the you know all that but it just comes out like snarky and like, why are you always, like, whining and complaining? Like, because that's what she's always doing. And I didn't like that because that's not how it was originally. So, however, whatever they did to interpret that behavior of hers just didn't come off well. Then they introduced another character called YB. And, I mean, someone pointed out that he was there just so that Coraline wasn't talking to herself because of course the book is in first person and so we're in Coraline's head we know what she's thinking but in the movie you have to have her say things and so they like what she's thinking because we're not in her head and so they added this other character for that but I don't know man like that's fine that makes sense but they just didn't do it well somehow it just came out like I was put off by by his character and like how they went about it he was just kind of irritating it's like each time he came on screen i was like why is this guy here again can he like go off because he he just came in at random moments he wasn't there i think he kind of like also helped at the towards the end when they were like getting rid of the other mother and i was just like no, I just didn't I just didn't like him, so you know, whatever. So the verdict is I still prefer the book. Honestly, in this case, I was going in thinking I would prefer the movie or I would just be like just watch the movie. But there's this character I mean Coraline is the main character and they just warped her personality to a point where I'm like, no, I didn't like that. But to be honest, it's quite close just because the movie is so visually appealing because of the stop motion. And, you know, if you don't really care too much and you're kind of intrigued by what I've talked about in this video, just watch the movie like it's fine. But just note that in case you see Coraline being a bit whiny and being a bit too much, just know that that's not how she is in the book. But you can watch the movie. Otherwise, I'd have to say the book wins this time. A compromise as well is to listen to the audiobook. I've listened to like five seconds of it, like a very small snippet, and it sounds good because it's narrated by Neil Gaiman himself and he does all the voices and it's like very dramatic. So that's also like option C, which actually is a good option. All in all, this is just an extremely satisfying story to read or watch or consume. You know, sometimes we really try and find meaning within books, like what's the theme and like what's the message especially because it's a children's book and it's like what message are you passing on to the children but this book is just weird like neil gaiman just said weird rights like weird people rights and you know he really delivered on that all the characters are extremely well done and extremely weird and it's just one of those books where you just read for the escapism or the fiction and it's just beautiful in that way in itself it really embodies the quote that comes at the beginning of the novel that reads fairy tales are more than true not because they tell us that dragons exist 
but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And it's by G.K. Chesterton. That is basically a really good summary of what you, the feeling you get out of this book. Which children's book would you recommend to me? I love kids lit. Books that are meant for younger audiences. So if you have any recommendations for me, please leave them in the comments. Okay, excitement time. Now this is the section where I'm talking about the readathon. Lexa and I are teaming up to run a two-week readathon from December 1st to December 15th to read Meja Mwangi's works. He's a Kenyan author. He's written 23 books. He's been active for a very long time writing. And Lexa loves him. If you go to her channel, which you should, and you should also subscribe while you're there, she talks about him quite a bit. And like she's made me excited to read his books. And when she was running the Kenyan readathon, I started on one of his books and then I just never quite finished. Uh, but now I have a chance to finally read um, three of his books, which I'm like are in my TBR for this readathon. I'll be reading Kill Me Quick, which is his first novel, The Mzungu Boy, and If the Stars Align, The Cockroach Dance as well. So if you want to join in, if you've never read his books like me, if you've heard of him, if you've heard of Kill Me Quick, which I think most Kenyans have heard of, or if you've read his works and want to read more, because as I said, he's published 23, you can join in. Uh, we'll be active mostly on Instagram to give updates. And then at the end, we'll have a YouTube live session. We'll give more details for the YouTube live um, as the 15th approaches. So just follow us on Instagram. Also in the description, you'll find the document for the readathon. You can see all his books. You can read a bit more uh, from Lexa. And also for the Kenyans watching this, Nuria the store has a 10% discount on Mejamwangi's books for this two week period. So this is your chance to just like grab as many books of his as you can and just like indulge in some Kenyan fiction. Okay, that's it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Um, like, subscribe, all those things. Or, you know, if you don't want to, don't. I'll see you next time. Came to your city all night. It was litty. We blow like 50 on Nana and Ricky. 31 for my 50s. Lane dripping for my linen. Stay speaking on past lives. All past tense reminiscing. Good times in the mission. Balling hard and efficient. Pull up and show out your kids with a tech and a lesson. It's all cap.